So let's begin. Debt instruments. A debt instrument is a private money loan secured against first deed of trust and first lien position. It's a debt instrument. Now a debt instrument can actually exist in a lot of different forms. It can be a first, it can be a second, it can be a third, it can be a fourth. A debt instrument is anything where there's a principal amount that you're agreeing to pay, an interest rate, and a term, or a period of time over which you're going to pay the loan off. Now, debt instruments are all transferable. So the debt space is a very exciting space, and you can essentially play in it in two places. You can either create debt instruments, or you can buy debt instruments. Okay? So you can write new, that's called originating, or you can buy existing, that's called buying existing paper. Now, both come with their own inherent challenges, and we're going to talk about that a little bit here today. So you agree to lend X number of dollars, and the person who borrows it agrees to make X number of payments. Sound right? Now, our entire country has been built on debt. You guys know this? So when we first settled America, have you ever heard the term, or you guys have heard the, the adage that Jews are very good with their money? Right? Especially in New York, the Jewish population there, they like own everything. Have you ever wondered why? Anyone? Okay, so when the pilgrims first came over, they were fleeing British control, English control, and they really wanted their own society, their own economy. So they came over to escape that. They were called the Protestants, correct? And if you break it down, it's Protestants. And they're protesting the Catholic Church because they felt like the Catholic Church was fleecing the flock, if you will, and just robbing them. So they came over to the United States and said, hey, you know, we need money to build this and that. But they refused to charge their other brother's interest. The Jews, on the other hand, had no problem charging interest. Because if you read the Old Testament, it's fine to charge your brother interest, okay? It's in the New Testament that we learn about not charging interest. Now, I don't have a problem with it either way, and I'm not a Jew. That, I'm a Gentile. That said, the Jews essentially built America through lending money to the Protestant people. And that's where we got this whole concept of debt, debt instruments. Now, the other thing that made America great is we were the first country that didn't have debt or prison, which meant if you borrowed money and didn't pay it back, you wouldn't go to jail. You could actually file bankruptcy. Now, if you look at the book of Leviticus, Leviticus, under God's law, or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in the book of Leviticus, you could actually borrow money, but it had to be forgiven every seven years, which is why all of your bad stuff on your credit drops off every seven years. So I don't know if you knew that that's straight out of the Bible. Um, so we're still in a lot of ways following God's law, which is great because we are no longer one nation under God. I would like us to be, but let's be honest, we're not. That said, uh, when you came to America, you could borrow a whole bunch of money, do whatever you wanted, and if it went sideways, you just filed bankruptcy. Now, we've talked a little bit about student loans because student loans are dead, aren't they? But what Congress did is they said, all right, we're going to make student loans so incredibly affordable and cheap, but you can't discharge them in bankruptcy. So it's one of the only non-dischargeable debts in bankruptcy, which is why it's straddling our kids. So you've got to know how all these debts work, how they play together, how you buy them, how you leverage them, how you service them, and how you obtain or acquire them. All right? So there's three ways to invest in paper. You can either represent paper. This is essentially brokering. It's no different than being a private money broker, except you're brokering existing paper. You're not underwriting or originating new paper. You can also do it by purchasing it, ownership and control, or you can do it as an affiliate. All right, now some basic trainings of a note, some terms to know, paper. Paper is the term we use to refer to all debts all over the place, it's paper. So if you hear somebody, if you ask somebody, what do you do, oh, I buy and sell paper. They're talking about debt instruments. Now a note, a mortgage, or a deed of trust, these are the instruments that create the debt. So in a non-judicial foreclosure market, you're going to get a note and a deed of trust. In a judicial foreclosure market, you're going to get a note and a mortgage, okay? 
So the mortgage is the debt instrument that we use in judicial markets. A deed of trust is the debt instrument we use in non-judicial markets. So you need to make sure that you're buying the right type of paper. Now you can actually do a mortgage in any state because a mortgage is the old standard, the deed of trust is the new standard, and the mortgage can still be used in a non-judicial market. Utilize a mortgage if you believe that the borrower is going to take you, take, snake you over. Okay? A mortgage document allows for you to go after a deficiency judgment in the event that you incur a loss. A note and deed of trust, traditionally the way it's written, is so that you can foreclose quickly, but recover the asset and not pursue the borrower. So you gotta make sure you know what you're buying if your intentions are to pursue the borrower. There's a lot of money to be made in judgments against these borrowers. These are deficiency judgments. Um, if you borrow $100,000 and the bank has to foreclose on you and they sell the property for $60,000, you own 40 grand. Now what a lot of homeowners didn't realize in 2008 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 as they were negotiating short sales on their primary residences, they didn't realize that banks could come after them for the deficiency judgment. However, under the Jobs Act in 2010, President Obama basically said, if it's a primary residence, we will forgive the debt. All right, well, forgivable debt is income. So a whole bunch of homeowners got taxed on that 40,000 bucks when they weren't expecting it. So now their tax obligation is through the roof. So this is important for you guys to know because as you're now going out into the marketplace as a real estate professional, a mortgage professional, you've got to know what you're getting your clients into. And you've got to speak intelligently and let them know what their options are. So you got to know this stuff. Foreclosure. This is what we do when we don't, when you don't pay us. And lien position is what you got to make sure that you are buying. We do not buy juniors if the value is not there. Now I will tell you that one of my favorite strategies in the note space is buying the second mortgage of a property that's about to go to auction. Dan, can we go to the Elmo? Let me show you guys this strategy. Now I stumbled upon this strategy by accident. As you guys know, I used to do a lot of short selling. And I will continue to do a lot of short selling when the market calls for that. But you've got to know when it's time to short sale, you've got to know when it's time to originate, you've got to know when it's time to buy and hold, and you've got to know when it's time to buy and flip. Okay, the market should dictate your entry and your exit. So with that, what should you be doing right now in your market? Buying, fixing, flipping, short selling? The answer is it depends where you're at in the country. Here in Dallas, 60 day market time, market's crazy here. Inventory's the problem. Get everything you can get your hands on. But you are crazy if you think you're gonna make a bunch of money short selling. Because most properties are worth more than the amount borrowed against in 2010, 11, and 12. So value's gone up, therefore short sale's not a strategy you should be utilizing right now. Uh, I was short selling a property uh, with the homeowner and the property was worth about 160,000 and the homeowner owed 200. Now, they had a first mortgage of 120 and they had a second mortgage for 80,000. Now, I had put in an offer cuz the first was going to open the bidding at uh, 80,000. So I had put in an offer to buy this second mortgage for 500 bucks. Now when you short sale a piece of property, you begin by negotiating with the first lien holder. Never the second, never the third, never the junior. You don't even need to talk to them. Don't call them, don't alert them, do nothing. Just get an offer from you. Now, in today's market, you've got to list a short sale with a realtor, which is why it's important to be one if you're not, uh, or you need to have a friendly realtor that gets it. You've got to list the property on the MLS. Now, what Regan and I used to do is we would list the property for the amount we were offering. So we would go to the homeowner pre-list as an agent, and we would say, look, we want to buy your house, and at that time we were buying it, renting it back to the, the homeowner. Now you can't do that. However, 
you can buy the house and then move that homeowner into one of your rentals. Now, some of you would say, why would I take a homeowner that's not paying their mortgage and stick them in one, one, in one of my rentals? Because I want the house. That's why. Okay? So we want to give the homeowner options. So we would list the property for 80000 because that was our, our offer price. Then we'd assemble the short sale package, and then we'd negotiate with the first lien holder. So the first on this was like, yeah, okay, we'll take eighty. The second, however, wouldn't budge, wouldn't budge, wouldn't budge, wouldn't budge, until finally it's going to auction. Now, I called the second lien holder and I said, look, you are holding up this entire foreclosure process, and if you don't do something, this thing's going to auction tomorrow and you're not going to get anything. So they conceded and they said, okay, Lee, if you'll buy the second for 500 bucks, we'll sell it to you. I said, okay. So I bought the second for 500 bucks. What am I entitled to? 80000 now, when the property goes to auction, the house is worth 160 as is, fixed up, it's going to be worth about 240 So is that a pretty good spread if I can get it anywhere near 120 Okay. Now, here's what's great. Up to $200,000, the max that I will pay for this property is $120,500. Somebody tell me why. Okay, I don't have the rights to the first and the second. Well, the first mortgage is, the uh, first paper is 120. Okay, the first is 120. Yes, and you, you have the right to the, the second, that's $500. Right so they already give away that right to the bills. Okay. Um, to cover the first cost is 120, so that's how much you're insured. <coughs> okay, so let me ask you guys this question. When I go to auction, let's say that the opening bid on this thing is, let's say that we bid it up to 120. Where do all proceeds from the sale go? To the first lien holder. If the property gets bid up to 150, the first gets 120, that leaves 30. Who gets that? The second. Who now holds the second? I do. So I can literally bid up to $200,000 and still only pay 120,500 bucks for the property because the trustee is going to cut me a check for 795 because I'm the second lien holder. All of the overage proceeds from a foreclosure auction go to pay the first in full, the second in full, the third in full, the fourth in full, however many liens that are there, any surplus proceeds then go where? taxes, HOAs in some markets, and then finally the homeowner. So one of my biggest pet peeves is when I hear about investors going out to homeowners that have a house worth 150 and they owe like 50,000 and they tell the homeowner, you do realize if this goes to auction next week, you're going to get nothing, right? And that's a bold-faced lie. Because as the house is worth 150 in any given market, it's going to bid up to at least 90 to 100,000. So, how much overage proceeds are there if the property sells third party at the trustee sale for 50, for 90 grand? What's the overage proceeds? 40, it's 40,000. Who does that go to? The owner. Homeowner. So, are you guys shocked to learn that investors will actually go to these homeowners and tell them you'll get nothing at auction? So deed your property over to me and you won't get foreclosed on. Did you know that this happens? Yeah. Happens all the time. Unscrupulous investors really tick me off because they don't have to do that. They can still be a blessing to the homeowner. Now, the way that I would approach a deal like this is, and I've done these, this is what's called an equity deal. Equity deals are probably one of the fastest ways you can make money. You have a leak? You might have a short sale the hotel. Where's it coming down? Do you guys want to move? There's chairs over here. Oh, that pan's just going to...
<laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, roofers, let's go. Guys, we're 10 stories below the roof. That's the AC system. Hey, that's the AC, AC system. Good. It needs to cool off in here. All right. Now, here's what I say to a homeowner, okay? First of all, you need to know what's happening at the foreclosure auction. So if you guys are not going to the auction, you need to add that to your weekly list of to-dos if you have auctions weekly. Now here in Texas, you guys have Super Tuesday, which I both love and I hate. The reason I love it is it's total chaos. I have been to Super Tuesday in multiple counties here in Texas and it is a madhouse down there. And there's a whole bunch of people that don't have a clue what they're doing, looking around, trying to figure it out. And there's like three investors that are down there with pockets full of cash and they're buying everything. So you look at that environment and go, good grief, that's a really intimidating environment, but you gotta know that you could have bought those properties months before had you just pursued the borrower at that time. So when you pull the notice of default list or the foreclosure list, uh, in any given market, what you're looking for is this type of a scenario. Okay? I want properties that were acquired in like 1981, 1990. Now, my favorite year to do anything is always 17 and a half years from present. Does anybody know why? Okay, year 17 and a half in a 30 year mortgage, a greater majority of your monthly payment goes to buy down principal than interest. So if I'm going to wrap or assume or take subject to an underlying mortgage, I want it to be aged at least 17 and a half years because I'm going to buy the note with about 65% of the principal still owing and I'm gonna pay it all off in 13 years. So my equity acceleration from principal buy down is, goes at a rapid clip because I'm buying a seasoned note. Now, you can actually research seasoned notes if you know where to buy the leads. And it's very easy to do. Is anybody interested to learn how to do that? Okay, make sure you come back. We will cover that. Now, if I find a homeowner in this situation, I do not do anything other than go straight to the property. And I'm gonna knock on the door and I'm gonna call and I'm gonna do whatever I can to get in front of these people. Now, if I know that properties of the auction are selling on average for about 65 cents on the dollar, what's the house worth? 160. House is worth 150, right? Right here, okay? So 65% of that is 97.5, okay? All right, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, your house is worth about 150 grand. Uh, if it goes to auction, the opening bid with your full debt payoff is going to be somewhere around 55000 And properties at the auction are typically going for about $0.65 cents on the dollar. Now, your house is in relatively good shape, so it could go for more. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, do you have any money? Could you cure the arrears? Could you do anything to bring this thing current? No, Lee, we're just going to let it go to auction. Okay. Now, pause there. You guys are all private money brokers in here, right? Or about to be? Yeah. Can you lend this person money? No. Who says, yeah, we can absolutely lend that person money? Okay, and who says, no, we can't lend that person money? And who doesn't know? Okay. Who lives in the property? A homeowner. Is it owner occupied? Yes. Are you a licensed mortgage loan originator? No. no. You cannot lend owner occupants. Okay? You cannot lend owner occupants. So resist the urge to give them a loan. Now, you can lend to them for other things. For example, if all they need is five grand, do they have a Harley Davidson in the garage with a free and clear title? Because I've leveraged a Harley's title before to, get, to lend money. Do they have an RV in the parking lot with a free and clear title? because I've leveraged RV titles to give people money. So we can lend them money on a lot of things, just not the house. But if they don't want the house and they've just, and you will find homeowners, if this is a few days before auction, they have exhausted any possibility of stopping this thing. And some of them almost look at the auction as a quick liquidation to get my cash and run. So I'm gonna say to the homeowner, okay, 
if this goes to the auction, 65 cents on the dollar is probably where you're going to end up, which means 97.5, you owe 55, you're going to get 52.5, or no, that's 42.5, from the sale of the auction, 42,500. Now, you can take your chances at the auction, or I'll give you $35,000 cash right now. Could the house sell for less than 65 cents on the dollar? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Could it sell for more? Yeah. Did I tell them that? No. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you could get more, you can get less, but I can give you 35 grand right now. Now, do I have to go down to the auction and competitively bid against all of those rich pocket filled with cash people? No. no. Now, there's no greater feeling than negotiating this deal putting it all together, running the check down to the trustee the night before the sale, and then having this sale get canceled. Ladies and gentlemen, the property located XYZ Street with an opening bid of $55,000 has been canceled. And they don't realize that I'm standing over there with a deed to the property. Ha! <laughs> My point here is, if you're going to the auction to buy these deals, you are missing the real value. You should have gone months before. Now, this is what's called a full debt payoff, okay? And it's an equity deal because the amount owing is significantly less than the amount or the value. This is an equity deal, okay? So please write down equity deal. Equity deal equals fast cash. Microphones for questions. Okay, so I understand how you go and you offer them the 35000 but how are you satisfying the lien for the lender? Okay, good. How am I satisfying the lien for the lender? There's two things that can happen here. You can either redeem or cure the underlying lien with the lender. Now, past what is called the redemptive period, which is typically 90 days, once you go into the sale advertising period, which is typically three weeks in any market, you gotta advertise property in a public circulated uh, paper in the county that the property is located in for three consecutive weeks. In that period of time, the bank most likely is going to demand payment in full. So if they want payment in full, then you've got to go muster up 55 grand at a minimum to bring to the trustee and pay the loan off. That's the only way to stop the auction if the bank is unwilling to cure or redeem. So the loan has to be paid off in most cases. Now the reason I say 55,000, could we do a $35,000 promissory note with the seller and say I will give you your 35 grand when you get out? Could we do that? Sure. Absolutely. So you negotiate the terms with the seller. You then draw the purchase and sale agreement and the note and the deed of trust. Who now has the absolute exclusive right to purchase the property? You do. So you're going to truck down to the trustee with your purchase and sale agreement and your cashier's check for 55 grand, and you own the property. And they will issue to you a trustee's deed. When do you have to pay the $35,000 to the homeowner? When they get out. Now, should you give the homeowner the $35,000 before they get out? No. no. <laughs> so you're in it for 90, right? Because you're paying the 55 and the 35. Yeah, I'm in it for 90. Okay. Yeah. But what would I have been into it if I would have gone to the auction? If this thing goes to auction, somebody's going to pay 110, 120. 125, especially in a market like Dallas where values are escalating pretty rapidly. I mean, what's your annual appreciation here? 10, 15? Okay, so if value is 150 and it's going to go up 10% this year, what's it going to be worth next year? 165. So people will bid in the 120, 130 range for a lot of times just to get their money deployed. See, there's a big problem when people are sitting on a glutton of cash and they don't know what to do with it. So they're looking for options of places they can put their money and they'll put it into a property because is 10% return on your money pretty good? 
So if I buy the property for 150 grand and it goes up 10% next year, did I get a 10% return on my money? Yes. Yeah. So you've got to understand what's motivating people to buy some of these properties. Sometimes it's a straight appreciation play. Sometimes it's just a straight park my money in something play because your money stuck in real estate at par is still better, assuming values go up, is still better than having it sitting in some IRA account idle. As we talked about the custodial firm that's got $14 billion under management, eight of it undeployed, $8 billion sitting there not earning a return? That's crazy. Well, why don't more people invest? They don't have time, they don't have knowledge, they don't know what they're doing, uh, they're scared. Um, and, and think of who has these huge Roth IRA accounts. Doctors, attorneys, successful salespeople, business owners. Do they have time to be evaluating investment opportunities and deploying their own capital? Rarely. So, you know, good intentions just delay, 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 and they never get around to investing in anything. That's where you guys come in, and that's what we talked about on the first day when I was showing you how much liquidity there is in the marketplace. It's really easy to get a hold of, too, if you know what you're doing. Can you go back to the Elmo, Dan? Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, slides. All right, so example of a lien position. If you were to sell your house today, you might find buyers who qualify for a mortgage with a traditional lender, but who may ask you to carry a small balance as a second mortgage lien. The lender's first lien mortgage takes precedent over your second lien mortgage, and if the payer falls behind on their payments, you would in order need to foreclose. You need to keep the first lien payments current. If other, on the other hand, the first lien holder foreclosed, they could totally wipe out your position unless you have the cash to pay them off, the property sold for enough to pay you both off, or you made an arrangement with the first lien holder to take over the first lien. Now I asked you guys this question on day one, if you foreclose on a junior lien or a junior position, do you own the property? And the answer is, yes, you do. You own the property. Back to the Elmo, Dan. Okay, so I find a house value 200,000 Underlying mortgage, um, one, let's call it one, 100. It's an investor, you know, they need some money, they need some equity out of this house, and they, they're gonna do great things with it, so they wanna leverage it up to 65%. What is 65% of 200? It's 130,000. So, they have an existing for 100, I put in a mortgage for 30, okay? Am I okay? Am I in relatively good shape at this point? I'm at 65 cents on the dollar. Value's 200. Am I, you guys like this loan? Okay. Borrower decides to stop paying me, which means this note is now in default. So I'm going to foreclose and I'm going to get this back for for $30,000. Do I own the property? Yes. Subject to the first. Okay, now I have the absolute exclusive right to pay the first in full. Do I want to pay the first in full? No. Preferably not. Why? Okay, could I negotiate with the first lien holder? Sure. Okay, so it's Judy, right? Yeah. So Judy, you be my first lien holder, okay? okay? And let me give you a microphone here. Okay. Hi, Judy, this is Lee Arnold. Um, you and I are actually co-mortgagees on the property over there on Cheyenne Street. Um, I lent a $30,000 second, Judy, and um, I had to foreclose. So I actually own the property, but I need to get you taken care of. Uh, Judy, would you take $60,000 for your, for your loan? You know, I was just looking at that the other day, Lee, and I've got a solid $200,000 value on that property. I don't see that I can discount it that much. How about $70,000? Um, I'd go eighty. dollars you would go eighty. dollars I'd go eighty. dollars Sold. Okay, now let's reverse roles. Okay. All right, you be the second lien holder, I'll be the first. Okay. Um, 
Lee, I understand you have a first lien on this property. I have just foreclosed on the second lien for thirty thousand. Cool. And um, I know that balance is a hundred thousand. I'd sure like to negotiate something a little bit less because I am going to pay you cash and clear it out. Cool. <clears throat> what do you, do you an think? offer for me? Yeah. What What do you think you'd be willing to take? Well, what do you think it's worth? Um. You know, I'm just not sure about that. I think it would, I'd have to, um, uh, I'd like to hear what you think you might be willing to do. Well, you called me. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, 60000 60000 Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, but no. Okay. Are we done? No. Okay. <laughs> what else you got? Uh, 65000 No. Okay, then Lee, what number do you have in your head? Well, right now the full debt payoff on the loan is 105. So I'll take 105. Okay. Well, let me leave my name and number with you. If you change your mind, please okay. call. All right. Uh, and just so you know, Judy, if, if you don't give me 105, I've already f initiated foreclosure. So I'm going to take this thing to auction and it will sell for 105. So I would encourage you to bring me a check for 105, or I will make sure your second's wiped out. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very aware of that risk. Okay, good. So Appreciate do it. you need my address for my routing or wiring information? <laughs> um, I would like to have that information. Okay. I'll get back with you. What's your email? I'll email it to you. All right. <laughs> Round of applause for Judy. <laughs> Okay, why am I not going to discount? I don't have to. I'm at like 51 cents on the dollar here. I'm in a great position. I'm not discounting at all. And if you called me and asked me to, I think you're nuts. Uh, and I set you up, Judy, so you're not nuts. Rolling in the back. Aren't they required to refinance? You can call the note as soon as they change the title. I own the property. Yes, yeah, so you can call it right away that she's got to come up with the money no matter what. You don't need to go to foreclosure for her to do that. Yes, I do. Because I can't force her to pay me. I can't force her to pay me. The only thing I can do is foreclose because I'm the first lien holder. And if the homeowner defaults on me, I can foreclose. But here's typically what happens. Most homeowners continue to make payments on the first. It's the junior liens that they're going to default on, which is stupid. Because the best thing you can do is default on the first and keep paying the second. Because now the first is going to foreclose, the second is going to scramble to pay the first off to protect their position. So now your junior lien holder is going to bankroll you on the first and you're going to, you're going to get another 12 months in the house. I wrote a white paper the other, uh, years ago during the short sale craze called How to Live in Your House for the Next Five Years Without Making a Payment because it's very easy to do. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I have a lot of favorite stories, but I like this one. Uh, I had a woman uh, who came to me in 2004 in Salt Lake City, and uh, she owned a eight, two and a half acre parcel of horse property on the East Bench. Anybody familiar with Utah? Okay, this is highly valuable property. Uh, where she sat with the house and everything else, it was worth about $750,000 and she owed about five hundred and eighty dollars on the house. So she called me on one of my letters. At that time we were dropping a ton of letters to NODs. I had commercials running on TV. We were marketing like crazy in Salt Lake. So she called me and said, Lee, um, here's the situation. I said, okay, great. Um, why are you in default? She said, well, my husband up in the night just left me and my four children. I said, he just left you? Yeah. Have you talked to him? Nope, haven't heard from him. Really, and how long? It's been like six months. Was he abducted by aliens? Do you know if that occurred? She's like, no, he just left me. I was like, all right, well, you're in foreclosure. The bank's about to take your house, so we need to start a short sale. I need you to give me your tax returns, because a short sale, you need two years tax returns. You need bank statements. You need pay stubs. You need an authorization letter. You need all these things to build a short sale package. She says, well, Lee, I, my husband and I got married out of high school. I've never had a job, so I don't have any income. My husband handled all the finances, so I don't know the bank account information. And he filed all the taxes, and I don't know where that is either. I said, oh, this is going to be interesting. 
So, through all of that story and her situation and me threatening to take to the press and everything else, we kept that woman in her house until 2009 and she didn't make a payment. And in that case, she didn't have to file bankruptcy. Now, what's, what really makes me upset is when I talk with some of you, and I just had a conversation last week with a woman who had filed bankruptcy, and I said, well, tell me for how much? She says, well, the banks are coming after me for about 60 grand. I said, you filed bankruptcy on 60 grand? I said, do you have a job? She said, no. I said, how are they gonna garnish wages? Do you have any assets? No, I rent. What are they gonna attach to? Why did you file bankruptcy? I don't know, that's what my attorney told you to do. Is that maybe because they get paid for filing bankruptcies? So you guys need to understand here, you can really be a blessing to a lot of people if you'll just learn this stuff, because homeowners are getting taken advantage left and right. So that woman was able to stay in the property for a very long time because we knew the laws. Now my biggest fear as a lender is that one of my borrowers is going to read my white paper. <laughs> on how to stay in your home for five years without making a payment because there are some pretty interesting things most of the laws that benefit the homeowner do not apply though to non-owner occupants and investors which is why we service that subset and we don't do owner occupied loans I can foreclose on an investor much quicker than I can on a homeowner all right so in this scenario Judy you're gonna pay me the 105 if you don't I'm gonna foreclose you out Rashid, here comes a microphone. Yeah, I'm just curious about why you're doing it, why you're, you're, you're buying on the second mortgage when uh, indeed people can really stay stuck on the, on the first mortgage with, with that budget. I just want to get the, I have a feeling that maybe a lot more people may not, uh, I mean, may be willing to negotiate down which may be part of what you are doing. That's my, my gut feeling, but I wanted to get the actual experience. Why am, I, why am I buying this second or why am I lending this second? No, why are you buying the second? Uh, when, uh, for instance, there is a possibility under that scenario that you demonstrated where the first mortgagee can really stick to the balance that is uh, on the, on, uh, owed to him or her. Okay, so, all right. Let's say that Judy won't budge. Judy is unwilling, and I've got to come in with five, with 105 grand to pay her off. What did I pay for the property? 135. What's it worth? Is that a good deal? Potentially, yeah. But I will tell you, I don't want to pay Judy off. If I'm lending in the second lien position, I don't want to pay Judy off. I want to leverage Judy's cash. So if I can come in with 30 grand. And rather than foreclose on the homeowner, I go to the homeowner or the investor and I say, look, you owe me 30 grand, you haven't paid me in months, I'm either going to foreclose and pursue you for my accelerated interest, my deficiency, my attorney's cause, and everything else, or you can just assign the property over to me and I will take over the underlying first lien. Now in that scenario, I don't have to alert the first lien holder that I'm taking it over. I'm simply going to set up payments through a third party escrow provider and I'm gonna to continue to send Judy her $1,100 a month on the $100,000 loan. Now, if I'm simply sending Judy a check every month for her 100 grand, how much cash do I actually have in the deal? 30 grand. So now I'm controlling a $200,000 asset for a $30,000 cash outlay. That's called leverage. One of the greatest invest, the reason real estate is such a great investment is you get leverage against the value. So if I put this $30,000 down in a second position, I fix it up, clean it up, sell it, and I make a $30,000 profit, what's my yield? 100%. 100%. If I can do it in six months, what's my yield? 200%. 200%. So Rashid, does that make sense? I can control the entire property for a little tiny sum of money. Now, what I would do on this type of a deal is I would do it out of my Roth IRA. So that my $30,000 profit goes back in tax-free. <coughs> make sense? Okay. Quite, any other questions before we move on? One Microphone, here it comes. Camille, we're going to start calling you Flash. 
Thanks, Flash. <laughs> Very speedy. <laughs> um, so, after you pay the thirty thousand, would you take that down to the trustee to record it um, on the title as your second lien holder? Yeah, this thirty thousand dollars. If I was going to lend this thirty thousand dollars, I would close at a title company. Okay. So we'd have HUDs, we'd have title right. insurance, we'd go through the whole thing. The deed of trust and all those different things. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to make sure. No, it's a great question because it's not uncommon at events such as these for people to go around to the individual members of the group and start soliciting cash. And they see things like, give me money. Hey, I've got this great investment opportunity. You can, you can get involved for 25,000 bucks. And there's no title, there's no recording, there's no property address, there's nothing. And I can't tell you the volume of people that have come up to me at one of these types of events and say, you know, Lee, I, I completely disagree with you on junior lien investing because I lost a ton of money. Really? What position were you in? Well, what do you mean position? I, I, just, I just gave them money. Well, then that's your fault. Okay? If you lose money because you did something stupid, you can't blame the investor or the person you handed your money over to. It's your responsibility to protect your assets or cover your assets, all right? That's your responsibility. So if you do it wrong, that's on you. But be wary of people that are in this type of an environment that are going around asking you to participate in this deal or that deal. If they refuse to close to the title company, oh, we don't need to incur all those additional costs. Let's, you know, it's the buddy system. Let's shake hands. No, no. And, and if they start preaching at you or saying, well, you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, or you're this religion and I'm this religion, did you guys know that Salt Lake City and the state of Utah is the number one bankruptcy state in the union? Utah is the number one bankruptcy state in the union. Why? Because people are just so trusting. Oh, well, you and I are in the same ward. You and I go to the same church. We're good. Let's shake hands. It's also the reason why more MLMs or multi-level marketing companies are started in Utah than any other state in the union. <laughs> It's a very tight-knit, connected community. And they rely on trust more than they rely on contract, which is silly, but that's the way it is. I have a quick question. Question back here. Oh, you have the mic. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah, I do. Uh, in this scenario, I'm assuming it, let's just assume it's a non-judicial state, and you've, you've had a deed of trust, and you foreclose on that 30000 Are you content with your trustee's deed? Is that all that you need to give you the right to move forward to deal with the first lien holder. As long as the trustee's deed is recorded. Right. Yeah, an unrecorded document doesn't have any, any strength. It's got to be recorded. So then you have whoever your substitute trustee is, do the foreclosure, walk right into the Kirk Court, file your document, and then you move forward from there. Yes. Okay, so it's all done with the clerk's office. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you treat it just like a first mortgage or any other mortgage because it's a mortgage. Okay. So it's got to be recorded. Uh, it needs to have a principal amount, an interest rate, a term. It's got to have all of those things. Thank you. Mark. <clears throat> Sorry. I kind of missed something there. I hate to make you repeat yourself. Could you briefly re-explain the part about paying off the first lien holder, the 1100 Who pays that? I missed that part. Okay. So, Mark, let's say that you're the homeowner, right? So, Mark, you borrowed $100,000 from Judy, and you borrowed $100,000 from Lee. Or I'm sorry, you borrowed 30000 from Lee. Oh, thank you. All right, so Mark borrowed one hundred grand from Judy. Mark borrowed $30,000 from Lee, okay? So Mark, you've been sending a check to Judy for the last couple of years for $1,100 a month, all right? I can take that mortgage with Judy subject to, you guys have heard the term get the deed or contract for deed. What that means is I'm going to buy the property from you, Mark, by simply continuing to service the debt that you owe Judy. So if you owe Judy $1,100 a month, as long as I step in and continue to make Judy's payment, I'm just going to continue to make payments on the loan. Now here's where you've got to be cautious. Judy's loan with you, Mark, could have what's called a due on sale clause, right? So if you transfer the deed of this property to me, that triggers default on behalf of Judy. Now, as long as I keep sending Judy $1,100 a month, is Judy going to foreclose? No. Probably not. Can she? Yes. Yes, she absolutely can. The, the deed of trust said, if you at any time transfer the loan, that triggers the due on sale clause. So she could foreclose on me. 
But do I care? No, because I'm going to send her a check for $1,100, and if she wants to call the loan or she checks the title randomly and says, hey, Mark, you transferred the title to this Lee Arnold guy. Yeah, I did. Well, you can't do that. All right, foreclose on him. Because that's what a do on sale is. It simply triggers the default of the mortgage and allows the underlying lien holder to foreclose. But does Judy really want to foreclose? Judy, I've been sending you $1,100 a month for six months. Do you really want to foreclose? No. Could she call me and say, hey, Lee, you're on the mortgage. Pay me my hundred grand, or I'm going to foreclose? Yeah, she could do that. And I would say, no, Judy, I'm not going to pay you the hundred grand. so go ahead and foreclose. Because it's going to take her six months to foreclose. It's going to cost her about $2,800 to foreclose. And does she really want to do that when I've been sending her a check for $1,100 a month every month anyway? The other thing is, if this is a private mortgage between Mark and Judy, there's probably some type of a balloon in the mortgage. Because if you're going to be lending private money, you better be writing in calls. Because you, do you really want to write a 30-year note? No. no. Okay, you're going to amortize it over 30, and you're usually going to have a 36, a 60, or a 72, or a 120 call. So Judy's now going to look at it and go, okay, well, I wrote it with a 60-month call. We're three years in. I'm going to let it ride for two years because he's got to pay me off in 24 months anyway. At least that's what Judy should do. And if Judy doesn't do that, then I'm going to convince her to do that. Because that's our job, guys. We are salespeople. And we've got to convince our clients to do what's in our best interest and theirs. Doesn't make any sense for Judy to foreclose. Does that make sense, Mark? OK. Ken. If in the foreclosure process, let's say it's it started, and you send Judy the check. For what, 1100 or yeah, 1000 for, for, for 1100 okay. know, whatever the regular payment is. Yeah. And she accepts that. Doesn't that stop the foreclosure, or, or, or it, it, does it disturb it in any way? No, because the fact that he transferred the note or the deed or the, the title of the property to me, the transfer of the title to me is what triggered the due on sale, which means at any time, Judy can actually foreclose. But if Even if she continues to accept payment, the loan is in default. Oh, okay. Make sense? Yeah. Because he transferred the title. Now, if I'm really all that concerned about it, I can do with Mark what's called a contract for deed. Hey, Mark and Roland, you guys can't be talking when I am. That's why you're not catching this, okay? So listen. When Judy continues to collect payment, it doesn't mean that the due on sale has stopped. It simply means that she keeps collecting her payment. Now, if I truly believe that Judy is, is crazy and she's going to foreclose, when I negotiate the deal with Mark, I'm going to do a contract for deed. What does contract for deed mean? It means under the terms of the contract between Mark and I, I'm going to continue to make the payment to Judy for $1,100. And after 24 months, Mark will transfer the deed to me. Contract for deed. Okay? So I'm going to continue to make payments for a period of time to eventually get the right to get the deed. So contract for deed does not trigger the due on sale because I don't have the deed. Mark does. So all we're going to do is I'm going to record on the title a notice of interest as the contract for deed recipient, but the notice of interest does not transfer the title, therefore not triggering the, de the due on sale, therefore disallowing Judy to foreclose. So title is everything in this business, and you've got to know how to read it, and you've got to know what you're looking for, especially if you're going to be bidding at auction. Because auction, you can make a whole bunch of money in a very short period of time, and you can lose a fortune. Now, true story, I was down at the auction one day, duplex worth $165,000 was going to sale. Opening bid, hundred grand. No, I'm sorry, opening bid was 35 grand. Duplex is worth 165, opening bid 35 grand. Who's interested? All right, who's bidding? All right. So the crier comes forward and says, all right, the, uh, I, the beneficiary, or I, the crier on behalf of the beneficiary, open the bidding on the property located at XYZ Street at 35,000. Do I have any other bidders? Who's bidding? 
All right, 35,000, what's your bid? Well, I heard 35.5, 35, 35.5 five, 35, five going once, 35.5, 38, I heard 38, 38, 38, 38, 38 going once. I heard 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 once, 40 once. I heard 50 over here, 50,000 going once, 50,000, 50, 52, 52, thank you, Anthony, 52. Ray, Ray, what do you got, 52, 50, 55, 50, 56, 56, 56, 56, 56, 75, 75, 75, once, 75, sold for $75,000. Good job. Woo! That's a good buy. Duplex value 165. Now I kid you not, that's exactly what happened. And this is what the guy said as he was walking up to hand his check to the crier. He said, holy cow, I read the books, I listened to the DVDs and watched the tapes. I didn't know it was going to be so easy. <laughs> now, there were five of us down at the auction. I didn't bid, nor did the other four players that bid on a regular basis. The reason I didn't bid is it was a second mortgage. And there was a first mortgage in front of it for 165 grand. And the duplex was worth 165 grand. So, now you wouldn't have bid, you would have known, right? Okay? This guy didn't know. So what he bought was a second mortgage for $35,000, but now does he own the property? Yeah. yeah. Subject to what? Subject paying off the first of 165. So what did he pay for the property? 165 and 35 would be 200, right? Once, no, no, no. This this guy at the auction paid 35 for it. Now he would have paid 220 or 230, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, but he he would own the duplex for 200 grand. So you've got to know what you're bidding on. And you got to make sure it's a first. You got to make sure there are no seniors. Now, what's a senior lien to a first trustee? Taxes. Taxes. What else? Uh, IRS. IRS liens. HOA. And now HOA. the state of Nevada has just enacted a new uh, a new thing with HOA liens. In the state of Nevada, HOA liens are senior to the first mortgage. Just Nevada right now. So Nevada is the only state in the union that has adopted case law that says a HOA lien is senior to the first mortgage. It's in California too. I mean, it hasn't enacted in California yet, but they're trying to. Now, I'm a proponent of HOA liens being the first lien or the senior debt to the first mortgage. Any reasons why you think I would say that? It protects the value of the property because if you've got a 200 unit condo complex and you got 50 homeowners that aren't paying their HOA dues, who's paying to keep the pool clean? Who's paying to mow the grass? Who's paying to fix the roof? That's what all of those HOA fees are, are going towards. So when that homeowner turns out to be a shady operator and not pay the HOA, now the weight of, of maintaining that property falls on 150 of the remaining owners, not on the other 50 who weren't paying. So banks literally were going in for closing the first and flipping off the HOA and saying, yeah, we owe you 15 grand, but we're not going to pay you because you guys got wiped out at the auction. Well, that doesn't mean the HOA doesn't have actual operating expenses. And HOAs don't make a profit, you guys. HOAs simply exist to pay the cost of maintaining the property. So if I'm, an HO, if I'm in that HOA, I want them paying their fair share because they're using the pool just like I am. So I believe we're going to see more and more HOAs becoming senior to the debt. Alan, who's got a microphone? Nasheed? Okay, Nasheed. Uh, whoever's got their hand up, make sure you get a microphone so you can go next. Go ahead, Nasheed. Okay, on this, on this a deal that's a thirty thousand dollar second mortgage and it's pay he he's paying the first and then he 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 takes the first over or pays them off and then he sells right or is he selling flipping who's fixing he? it up who's the, he the first the second mortgage owner. okay so me me yeah, me, me, you. me, not you, me. Okay. <laughs> this is my deal. Don't snake my deal. <laughs> okay. So the profit would be 70? Potentially. Yeah, instead of the 30, if it, if it sold for the, for the 200. Right. I'm okay. into it 130. 
Yes. Because I'm going to pay off the first if I have to. Yes. But my preference here is I can do a contract for deed with Mark. Uh -huh. I continue to pay Judy. Right. I go in, I clean up the house, I put it on the market for one ninety nine nine. Okay. I find a buyer. Okay. When you go to closing on the HUDs, it's going to say pay off of the first lien holder, Judy. Yes. So we would call Judy and say, Judy, I need a payoff statement, statement. from you. Right. That goes on the HUD. Then I'm going to present a payoff statement for my second, for the 30. Then we're going to have all of the other uh, taxes right. and insurance and everything else. And then there's a net, net, net cash to, cash to seller at the bottom of the HUD. Right. And that's going to show my profit. Okay. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. And go ahead to Alan. Only in the state of Illinois that I'm aware of, a properly filed mechanics lien can trump the first mortgage. Uh, some, some jurisdictions have said that mechanics liens are senior. Um, and you got a court battle. You got a court battle. Uh, and from my understanding of Illinois law, you as the mechanics lien placer have to show that you have been disparaged, meaning that the failure for them to make the payment on that has caused you financial hardship to the point that you now are in financial turmoil. Uh, and you know, if you're a big roofer or you're a big plumbing company, you're going to have a hard time proving that. So you're entitled to a portion, but rarely is the court going to unravel a foreclosure of a first lien to pay you. So tread lightly. I've seen it go both ways in Illinois. Look, I, I've had it go both ways on me also. But can you I, give him the mic? Big one. Mike. I had a big lien of $93,280, and we discounted it to $80,000 because we actually, we were with the interest, we were owed $115,000. So it was, and I had about 300 pages of documentation because it was a condo complex. Were you the mechanic? I was the mechanic. Okay. In what capacity? I, I was a general contractor. Oh, okay. And, and then uh, it, it was the an rehab? unusual, pardon me? On the rehab? On the rehab, yes. And I did 17 units. So it was a lot of work. And I, I had, because there were so many different things in each apartment, I had all the documentation for it. So I had them by the mm, short hairs and uh, was able to get, you know. Thank you. I, yes. Uh, so I, I was lucky on, it, on the case, but I, I actually was, I didn't realize that there was that other thing until it, it happened to me the other way. Yeah. Oh, I got hurt. Yeah. So I, I, you're absolutely right. Yeah. No, mechanics lien is a lien priority. It's on the title. So if you're short selling, it has to be dealt with. If you're foreclosing in the state of Illinois, you have a redemptive period. So within the redemptive period, you may have to deal with the mechanics lien. So in Illinois, if you buy it at the auction, it doesn't necessarily mean that you own it. Uh, because there's a redemptive period, the homeowner could come back and redeem, or the mechanics could come back and file a, a sublien or a claim. Now you've got to deal with a lawsuit. So my preference in Illinois would be to short sale, deal with it, close at title, so that everybody gets paid off and agrees and signs off. I get title insurance that I own it, it's free and clear, and then I can move on without any future worry. If we have any trouble with any of the loans, can you turn uh, There you go. If, if we have any trouble with any of the loans, you would handle that for us, correct? In what capacity? Yes. <laughs> A loan that you buy from and, me? And let's, let's put it this way. As the um, uh, individual that would uh, help foreclose uh, the property for your benefit. It's, it's, if like, any of the loans ever go bad, you would handle that situation. What is my role in the loan? Did I originate the loan? Oh, yes. Okay. If you originated the loan. I mean, if, no, I mean, so I originated that. the loan. Did you buy the loan from me? No, we, we brokered the loan for you. As a broker. Okay, but if I originated it, we closed it title, I'm in first position, and I have title insurance stating that I'm in first position. Okay, yeah. then So if then it goes sideways, the title company is going to sue whoever because they told me title was clear. I never closed without title insurance, showing that I'm in first lien okay, position. Okay. So if a mechanics lien pops up after the fact, the title company is responsible to pursue that claimant, not me. That, that may have been what happened with me. Um, you didn't have title insurance? No, we did have a title insurance, or they had title insurance, because I was the mechanics lien. And um, 
All I know is the attorney got the money. That's all I care about. <laughs> the attorney yeah. always gets the money. But, yeah. uh, do you guys know when you file a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is a reorganization of debt, do you know what, the, what payment gets paid first? Attorney. Attorney's fees. So there's a lot of money being a trustee in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy because you get paid first. Then your other debtors get paid. Yeah. You know, it helps when attorneys write the case law or the law that establish the payments of the bankruptcy, and especially in Illinois. There's more attorneys in Illinois than there are people. Let think through that. It makes no sense. Next. Um, I have a question about lien position. Okay. Um, so I was under the impression that an IRS lien follows the individual, not the property. That is correct. Okay, so IRS, if we're going in and we're buying these seconds and say, Judy owes the IRS, and I'm going in, I'm buying the second, and I pay off. Oh, okay. Tammy. <laughs> Tammy. <laughs> Judy owes doesn't the want a name associated with the IRS. <laughs> She owes the IRS, say, you know, $30,000, and they've attached a tax lien to her property. But I go in, I buy the second, then I go in and I pay off the first. I, we're not responsible for paying that IRS tax lien because it follows the individual. Uh, yes, however, the IRS can pursue the property if there was monies that tra changed hands. So if Judy, sorry Judy, but this is, this is your cross to bear. Uh, if Judy got paid out of the sale when she owes tax, taxes via the IRS, the IRS can pursue Judy or unravel the sale to make sure that they get paid from the proceeds of the sale. Okay, so, so the IRS can absolutely scenario, unravel it. We wouldn't pay... Um, like we were talking about paying them the the eighty thousand, we wouldn't give that to the homeowner. We would pay we would pay off the second. Well, it, again, understand that this is going to close with a title company, and there's got to be title insurance. So the title insurance company is going to pull title on the property and the seller, and if they see that Tammy o or Judy owes a hundred thousand dollars in tax liens. They're going to take the $100,000 that would be coming to her in the note, and they're going to just <laughs> suck it right out of her account. So that hundred grand is going to the IRS. Gotcha. It's the only way the title company can issue an insurance policy, because they're ensuring the title is clear, and there's nothing that's going to come upon you, the buyer. But if the IRS can unravel the sale, the insurance company is not going to insure that. So Judy's claim would have to be paid off. Now. One last thing before we go to break here, because you guys are jumping up out of your chairs, so I'm assuming we need another break, uh, is when you buy a property at auction, so let's say that I'm buying a lien dated 2010, um, $120,000, it's a full debt bid, and I pay $125,000 for it. However, there's an IRS tax lien dated 2009 for $40,000. Do I have to pay the IRS tax lien? Okay. Is the IRS tax lien junior or senior to the trustee for closing? Senior. It's senior. Why? Because date trumps all. This is why you got to know how to read title. Okay. What is the senior lien based on date or priority? It's the IRS lien. Now, when I buy this at the auction for $125,000, do I have to pay the IRS tax lien? Yes. No, because it belongs to the seller, all right? However, the IRS has 120 days to redeem. Now, what that means in a foreclosure situation is, a redemption by the IRS comes in the form of them holding their own auction. They have 120 days to hold the auction. They've got to post the property for sale. It's got to go to public bid. And they have to pay me back my purchase price of the auction plus 6% interest if they redeem. Okay. Now, if the property is worth $300,000, is the IRS going to redeem? Yeah, they're going to redeem. Am I going to get my money back? Yeah, yeah. 125 plus 6%. Well, whoop-de-doo. 
It's especially troubling if I borrowed the 125 grand from a hard money lender and I'm paying them 18 percent. IRS gives me six, I owe 18. Do I still owe a hard money lender 12? Yeah. yeah. All right. So when I buy this property at the auction, let's say that I buy it today. Uh, today is the 16th, 17th. I buy the property today. The IRS has not 120 days, which is going to take us to what is that, May? 120 days. The IRS has until May to redeem. Do I own the property from now until May? Yes. yes. Am I entitled to do whatever I want with my property? Yes. Am I going to renovate and rehab this property? No. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's worth 300,000 bucks. So I'm going to go ahead and start my renovations now. And I'm going to go into the property and I'm going to rip out the kitchens and the baths and the walls and the carpet. I'm going to rip everything out and I'm going to do it quickly. Because if the IRS is going to redeem, they're going to send out one of their lackeys to inspect the property to determine what they should open the bidding at. Now if they walk into the property and there's no kitchen, there's no bath and there's no carpet, are they going to redeem? No. No. Typically not. And I don't want them to. I got tremendous upside here. I don't want my 125 grand back. I want the house. So I'm going to go in and rip everything out. And then I'm going to call the IRS. And I'm going to say, hey, are you guys going to redeem on this thing or what? Well, we don't know yet. Well, why don't you send your inspector out? I don't know if it would be helpful. I can send you photos. Yeah, why don't you send you photos? All right, so now I'm going to send them pictures of the kitchen and all the lath and plaster walls piled up in the middle of the floor with all the plaster and the knob and tube wiring exposed and the lead-based pipes. And I'm going to draw little arrows to all my photos. Hey, you should look at this. Now, you can buy the IRS's redemptive rights, not buy them, but you can basically give them money not to redeem. Okay? So I can tell the IRS, look, you know, it would be worth it to me to just give you five grand to release your redemptive rights so that I can move forward with this rehab project. And we have negotiated with the IRS on outstanding IRS liens just in that manner. Hey, here's 500 bucks, just forgive your redemptive rights on this thing. Now, when they forgive their redemptive rights against this property, do they drop off against the person? No. So they're not taking 500 bucks for the $100,000 tax lien that Judy owes. They're simply saying they're not going to pursue this property for Judy's debt obligation. Make sense? Okay. So you got to know this stuff when you see it on title. Okay. All right. So rather than going through the whole formality of questions, if you have questions, come up and see me at the break. Otherwise, let's take seven minutes, take a break, and then get back in here. We got some cool stuff next session.